Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Ceasing the Sale of Invasives Update with Matt Arndt. The Grow Native program is a native plant marketing and education program that serves the lower Midwest run by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. My name is Erica, and I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, I will read those out to Matt. This webinar is being recorded. The link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. Matt Arndt is a consulting forester and arborist and is the owner of Matt's Healthy Woods and Wildlife. He carries certifications from both the Society of American Foresters and the International Society of Arboriculture. In addition to his full-time forestry work, Matt also has side businesses in native seed production and custom web development. He has served as president of the Missouri Consulting Foresters Association since 2013 and is the vice chair of the Missouri Invasive Plant Council. He also serves on the Natural Resources Subcommittee of the NRCS State Technical Committee, the Missouri Farm Bureau Forestry Advisory Committee, and the Cameron Park Board. And now I will turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and, and dive right in. We're gonna give an update on the cease to sale initiative um, that the Invasive Plant Council has been working on for, for uh, some time now. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I'd uh, point out, um, the Missouri Inv Invasive Plant Council used to be called the, the Missouri Invasive Plant Ta Task Force. Um, earlier this year, tail end of last year, we restructured and, and renamed the, the group, the Missouri Invasive Plant Council, as opposed to the, the task force. So if you notice that change, uh, it is in fact intentional. And just a little bit of background on MOAP itself. It was created in 2015, uh, spearheaded by Grow Native along with uh, agency and NGO partners. Um, current members include a, a, a pretty good <clears throat> array of different industries, different sectors. Um, most, uh, I, I believe this is all, and I, I may be missing a couple, but I think that this is all of the, the organizations that are represented as actual members at this point. Uh, we also include uh, other groups as, as stakeholder members, um, interested parties essentially that that uh, don't necessarily attend all the meetings, participate in, in all of the, the activities and, and subcommittees, that sort of thing, but, but are still um, interested in and want to be kept abreast of what MOIP has been doing. So when MOIP was originally organized, um, I wasn't actually a part of it as, as part of the inaugural, gr inaugural group. But um, these, there was a list of goals that were developed for the organization. And the one that we're really going to focus on today is the, the track and stop continued distribution of the known and future exotic invasive plants. And to that end, uh, I would start with uh, at least MOIP's definition of what is an invasive plant. And one of the earlier tasks that we worked on was um, standardizing definitions, what we're going to use internally when we talk about native plants, non-native, aggressive, and invasive. And uh, our definition of invasive plant is one that's both aggressive and non-native. And the key thing there is that it, it uh, causes or is likely to cause economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. And as we've been working on cease the sale, this is kind of a, an important topic in my mind because the, the invasive plants by definition in this case are ones that are causing economic harm, <clears throat> but the, the economic harm is not necessarily universal. And, and anytime we're talking about potential for legislation to limit the sale of something, there's also the potential for economic consequence on the other side of that. So it, it's just a, another caveat that, that we've had to make sure to, to keep in the, the forefront as we've worked through this process. So moving on to cease to sale initiative. Um, <clears throat> like I said, we've been working internally on it, uh, I believe since 2020. And we're, it's, it's certainly taking longer than we would have liked to have gotten to this point. It would have been absolutely wonderful to spend a couple months on it and, and have a finished product, but the, the nature of <clears throat> trying to work through and, and have, have the process be as, as thorough and objective as possible has, has led to uh, 
a little bit longer duration than, than I think that we would have hoped for from the beginning. So if, if you're interested in a, a deeper dive, um, something you can, you can spend some time and digest, the moinvasives.org slash CTS, CTS for Cease the Sale. Uh, moinvasives.org is MOIP's website. Um, Cease the Sale page goes through <clears throat> uh, multiple sections of essentially the rationale, rationale behind why we're, why we're um, taking this angle and, and what we're hoping to accomplish uh, through Cease the Sale. So that's, um, that's up and available to anybody on the, on the MOIP website. So the developmental steps we've worked on, starting with Cease the Sale, number one was the assessment of 142 species. Um, that was one of, actually one of the, the MOIP goals was developing and, and assessing the, developing this list, assessing those species, and, and the, the assessment was done based on regional abundance, impact, and trend of each of those species. It was a multi-year project, uh, involved reviews by 26 individuals, um, botanists, ecologists, you name it, they were on the list. Um, of all 142 species over six ecoregions. So you combine the reviewers with the species with the ecoregions, and there was not quite 2000 individual reviews that were put together. And one of the products of the, the assessment was a set of maps, like the, the example for calorie pair um, there in front of you. It's the, it, it shows, one second here. It shows the, the impact, the, the rating based on the impact, color-coded for scale, um, same for abundance and same for trend. A couple things to point out, we required for any given region that there be a minimum of three reviews per species before we would include it in the data set. Uh, so the gray is insufficient data. That would indicate that we did have reviewers uh, give information, give opinions on, on that species for that region but uh, we didn't meet the minimum threshold of three. And by, co by comparison, the white is no data was reported for that species for that region. So the next step was to identify and survey the stakeholder organizations. Any, any statewide um, or at least regional organization in the state that, that we could come up with that essentially had any sort of a stake, whether on the, the positive side or the negative side of a, a potential cease to sale legislation at some point in the future. Uh, we arrived at a list of between 90 and 100 organizations, um, and we, we sent a, a request for them to give us the, their level of support for a cease to sale initiative um, for each of the 142 species. And, and we did it in, on this round one survey include all 142 species with the, the goal being that <clears throat> we, we needed at least a baseline data set for, um, for all of the species, whether or not we intended to or, or ever have thought that we would eventually include them in, the, in a final proposal. So this was done by web survey. Uh, this is an example. Again, I, I chose calorie pair as the example. Um, the, the reviewer was sent a, a customized link, or the, the organization rather was sent a customized link just for their organization, and they could go through all 142 species, give a, essentially a, a one to five ranking, highly support to highly oppose, and then a, a justification, a, a comments, if you will, on, on why they, they gave the, right, the rating that they did. Moving on from that, the next step was to, to evaluate the round one results. We started with um, just a, a direct average of the respondents. Um, I put a, like I said, a one to five, used one for highly support, five for highly oppose, and the, the numeric value essentially averaged across every, all of the, the responding organizations for each species became that, that species score. Um, and Part of the, the things that we're trying to do from the round one resorts, number one is eliminate the species that we know will not be included in the final cease to sale proposal. Um, and then we're also looking to determine which, which species that we know at this point we will be in, including in a, a final proposal. And then for all of the ones in between, looking to develop a, a round two search 
survey of directly to individuals and businesses uh, to get their input. Oh, do we still have you there, Matt? Am I back? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. You might have to reshare your screen. I thought my computer was doing that for a second. <laughs> my internet dropped. Oh, no. Okay, I'll just start over on this slide. I'm not sure where I lost you. Okay, so, we can see it. All right. So the average support and opposition column is color-coded red to green. The, the darkest red at the top is the, the least level of support or the, the most opposition to potentially including that species in the cease to sale initiative down to green at the bottom is the highest level of support for including a given species in the, the cease to sale final list. Over to the left, the somewhat broken column is the invasiveness score. And that's a uh, essentially a score developed based on, it's, it's the same score that we used for the, the top 10 species per region lists. Um, this was, uh, in this case, it was the, the highest regional score uh, for that given species. And the, the thing that I would like to, to point out that, that I find interesting and encouraging is <clears throat> if you eliminate the, the first few reddish colored, the, the more invasive, at least the higher scored invasive species um, right at the very top, th these two color coded columns essentially follow an inverse pattern. The red at the top, the more opposition coincides with the, the green on the invasiveness score, which are the least invasive species. And as we move down to more support or le less opposition for inclusion in the, the cease to sale, we get down into the, the more invasive species. Um, the few anomalies that, that stand out, this red species right here is reed canary grass. Um, that's one that, that does have agricultural erosion control benefits, but it's also an incredibly invasive species. Um, so that, that species has less support than some of the other incredibly highly invasive species, um, at least less compared to proportionally to its invasive score. And as we get up here to the very top, this cluster of yellow orange, um, the, the higher scoring uh, invasive species, those are going to be some of the cool season grasses, the tall fescue, the smooth brome, the ones that, that certainly are invasive, but have uh, significant opposition to including those. And, and that, sub, that, that small subset of species, the, the tall fescue, uh, as the example, that those are ones that we have never expected that we would actually include in a, a final proposal. And, and that would be an example of one that, that at this point, we're, we're likely going to be comfortable stri um, striking from the, the final list and, and saying, you know, we, we acknowledge that the agriculture and economic value of the species outweighs the, the invasive side of things. Um, so moving on. <clears throat> The, the next step was to develop the round two, um, the develop the round two survey um, targeting individuals and businesses. The, the plan is and was and is to disseminate that survey through the 90 plus round one organizations, essentially ask them to, to pass the links along to their membership. And then also um, through direct communication, either through the MPF or, or Grow Native or MOIP website, through social media communications, through um, however, however it gets to somebody. Um, we're not requiring that anybody that takes this round two survey be in any way affiliated with one of the round one organizations or any organization for that matter. It, it could just be they come across the link and, and would like to pro provide their, their own input. 
Um, and as part of that, developing this round two survey, we decided to develop self-identify categories, um, essentially to give us a way to categorize and classify, group the results, group the respondents into various sectors and subsectors. And as it stands right now, this is our, our list. The, the, the yellow essentially, the headings are the, the categories, the white sub, the white subheadings are the subcategories within those categories. So by classifying it this way with a, a category and subcategory, it, it allows us to group the data in, in larger aggregates and then in smaller subsets. And as we were working on this, it started to become clear that that using these same categories, we could potentially actually have a, a more accurate understanding of our round one results. So once we got to this point, we hit the brakes a little bit and decided that it, it made sense to reevaluate the round one results based on these round two categories. And we have, and, and this is the point where we're at in the process right now. Uh, we've we've backed up just a little bit from where we wanted to be, and and um, we're working through this process right now. But we're associating all of the ninety plus organizations um, with all of the organizations and all one hundred forty two species into the round two categories. Essentially, does this organization as a whole? have a stake in what happens with respect to this given species. And the idea is that we're going to, that we want to be able to, to give higher weight to the opinion of an organization that has a direct stake in a species, whether the sale is ceased or not, against a, a, an organization that really has no direct stake, even if they might have submitted a, a response on that species for round one. And then we're also, planning to uh, re recreate the the average score as opposed to just being a direct average all across the responding organizations the, the score will be based on an ag an average of sectors and if we go back to the the categories and subcategories the sectors in this case will be the yellow headings so <clears throat> essentially we'll develop a, a uh, an average for landscape and hort professionals, for conservation nat natural resource professionals, and take those averages and combine them into one overall aggregate, as opposed to the scenario where we might have 12 conservation organizations and one landscape organization respond, or vice versa, then essentially the, the, the minority responding sector, their opinions get diluted by just based on sheer quantities. So the, the current plan is to aggregate based on the sectors and then combine the sectors to where each different sector is, is weighted evenly. And then from that, uh, after we, we rerun all the rankings, um, then we'll determine which species are, are we going to include in that, uh, in that round two survey. So the working draft right now, and, and I'd emphasize the draft, um, but this is the, the type of question we're expecting to, to ask in the round two survey um, as soon as we get there, which hopefully will be in the coming weeks, we'll be ready to, to send this out. But the, the idea is if the sale of, and, and this will be re repeated for all of the species that are included on the round two survey, but if the sale of this species were to be immediately restricted in Missouri, the financial impact on me as a whatever their self identification category or categories were would be, and they would choose from one of the, the six categories. And then we would ask that same question, but substituting restricted with one year notice, three, five, or never restricted in place of the immediately restricted. And the idea there is because um, in the nursery trade for some of these species, uh, and again, calorie pair, I would use as an example, the nursery crops are a multi-year crop. So we're, we're not trying to cause undue finan financial burden on any grower or or nursery owner uh, and tell them that all of a sudden, if the C6 sale becomes law at some point in the future, they have to destroy acres of um, nursery crops that they've been growing for several years, uh, just because now all of a sudden the, the sale is 
is restricted. So our, our plan for that is to identify species that, that may be multi-year crops and, and potentially have a, a phase-in time period of one, three, five years, essentially to, to allow the nursery growers, the, 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 the sellers, anybody that, that may have a multi-year stake in these species to essentially exhaust their existing supply, but, but not replant so that give them a chance to transition to a new species uh, and not have to expect them to de destroy existing stock that, that they have multiple years invested in. And once we, once we get the results from that, we will evaluate those results, um, develop the final proposal and communicate the, the plan to the legislator, legislators and, and find sponsors and um, hopefully multiple sponsors. And it is just that simple. So with that, I would entertain any questions. Hi, yeah, this is Erica again, um, and I'll read a few of the questions that we've received. Um, Leah Langdon asks, how does an organization get to be on your list of those who get surveys? So we have already completed the, the organization level. That was the, the round one survey. Um, and if hopefully we captured all of those, those organizations, um, we, we didn't get a universal response rate. Um, I don't recall offhand and I don't want to say the wrong number, but it, it was in the 20 to 25, if I remember correctly, organizations that, that responded. Um, so we, we didn't get universal response, but we have already gone past the, the organization level. Um, if, if you would be interested, um, Erica, do you happen to have the, the MOIP email address? I believe it's info at moinvasives.org. Um, I do not yes. know it. Brooke, yes, that is know? correct. Yeah, okay. info at moinvasives. And we'll include that in the email tomorrow. Okay, they'll include the email in there. Um, I guess I see no reason why we couldn't, at this point where we're at, include um, additional organizations. If there was an organization, I, I would. it would have to be a very quick turnaround. Like I said, we're... Um, we're ready to process those with the, the final categories and, and move forward into round two. But at the very least, um, the, we'd be happy to, to include the invite for the round two survey to new organizations. So send a request to info at moinvasives.org um, and pass that along and, and we'll proceed accordingly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question we had from Todd is, do your assessments of specific species as invasive and recommended for cease the sale, do you consider if there is a native substitute? He says native or non-native, but I think uh, native or non-invasive substitute. No, not directly, um, because it's, we're not, we're not necessarily, well, let me back up a little bit. In the assessment of invasiveness, no, we were not considering the potential for native or non-invasive substitutes. It, it, that was strictly a, an analysis of the invasive qualities of the, the species. As we move forward into evaluating those species for potential including, in, inclusion in our final cease to sale proposal, yes, that would be part of the, the aggregate of, of questions and topics and characteristics that, that go into that decision. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asked, hasn't the Missouri Department of Agriculture already put a stop sale on uh, calorie pear in the state of Missouri? I thought I saw a stop sale on a nursery tree. No, not on uh, calorie pear. There is the Missouri noxious weed law, um, which includes, and I, I won't remember all of the species offhand, um, but purple loosestrife, um, multiflora rose, I believe, is on there. Johnson grass. There's a, I, I think it's in the the 10 to 12, maybe 15 species range that of of species that are included in the existing noxious weed law. And and that's a, a good opportunity to point out that that we're not intending the cease the sale um, initiative or or any legislation that may come of it to be a replacement of the noxious weed law, but rather a, a, a completely separate 
um, a separate law. So the noxious weed law for the species that are included on that includes um, uh, a disallowance of sale. They, they can't be sold, they can't be moved, they can't be, um, it's, it's actually written in the law that that um, they have to be actively controlled. So any any landowner that has those the species on the noxious weed list um, is is technically supposed to be actively controlling them. So back to the question about a, a specific tree. No, I'm I'm not aware of um, anything with calorie pear. The it, it's possible that you had seen uh, something with respect to ash trees and and that ash couldn't be removed. That was based on the the invasive emerald ash borer, a half inch long bright green beetle that's in process of killing all of our ash trees in the state. <clears throat> um, so so movement of ash trees um, became restricted based on that across county lines. But uh, no, calorie pair hasn't been restricted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have two related questions here. Um, John asks, will cease the sale be implemented through state legislation, state legislation or by another mechanism? And Val asks, when do you hope to get a project to legislators? Well, we had hoped to have it to legislature, legislators uh, fall of 2020 when we started late summer of 2020, but that hasn't happened. Um, so sooner rather than later, but not at the expense of the integrity of the process. Um, and yes, our, our kind of working vision is that this would go through the legislative process and, and not a, a, a different potential rulemaking process. Um, we would, my personal goal especially, but, but I think as a, as a group, we're we're pushing to make this proposal as universally accepted as possible. I I don't want it to to turn into a, a, a sector versus sector fight to where you know it, it's somehow construed that the conservation sector is trying to impose this on the horticulture spec sector or the agriculture sector. I'm by the time we get to our final proposal, I, I very, very much want to have one that, that all of the sectors can agree to support. Um, and therefore it, it becomes a, a non, -con, a non um, uh, confrontational issue um, once it finally gets there. But yes, our, our working assumption is that it would be through the legislative process. Okay, and another related question, do you have any support in Jefferson City for this already? We have actually had a few legislators reach out and tell us already that they're interested in sponsoring it. Um, so there's, the, there has been just a, you know, making sure that we slow down and, and go through everything is as thoroughly and, and objectively as possible and that we don't get the cart ahead of the horse in that sense. But, but yes, we have more than, have had more than one legislator actually reach out and, and say that they're interested in sponsoring the, the potential final bill. Okay, great. Um, have, from Linda, have you thought about finding funds, governmental funds to buy up the stock of invasive species grown by nurseries once it is decided to cease the sale of a plant? Um, it seems destructive to continue sale of a banned species for additional years, and this would protect the investment of the grower. It, it has been talked about. No, we haven't actively looked at it. Um, part of that would, would potentially come from um, information we might get from the round two survey, just based on what exactly is the, you know, the total dollar value of all of the existing nursery stock. Um, I agree it would be it would be much better if we if if the sale of any given species does stop to to have it be immediate and not sell and, and expand distribution of of any additional plants but that comes into part of the the compromise with the growers and in order to potentially have them support this i, I think if we if we said you have to stop right now um, that would be the end of any potential support so whether or not there is government funds available um, i know that i haven't looked into that but yes that topic has been brought up um, but we haven't been act actively looking at it at least at this point Okay, um, Julie asks, are you looking to partner with stakeholders in other surrounding states such as Kansas? We, 
on on this topic we haven't there are some organizations that that we've been working with that do cross state lines um so in in that respect yes we have but um the 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 working plan for the cease to sale would cover sales in missouri so it, it would cover missouri selling to out of state it would sell it would cover out of state selling into missouri so <clears throat> as it is right now we're just planning to focus on missouri um we we're not as it stands right now trying to to work on a similar proposal in kansas or any other surrounding state um, but I mean, we'd, we'd certainly be open to um, having those conversations if there was an organization that wanted to partner on that. Okay, and then Mandy asks, who will enforce this? That's one of the topics and, and that won't be up to us to, to determine. Um, the, the working idea is it would make sense through uh, Department of Ag. They currently don't have staff or funding to to take on additional enforcement like this so so any addition any addition in responsibility um, would have to come along with an addition in funding accordingly um, but that would be uh, to, to us that makes sense as the potential future home of that enforcement but like I said it would have to come along with a budget increase to allow them to to do that but the final decision that for for that would come from the legislature Okay, we had a couple questions about specific plants. Uh, John asks, is Japanese bamboo on the list? Uh, not by that name, I don't believe. The bamboo that's on there is heavenly bamboo. Uh, it's possible that that's just a, a different name for the same species or, or one of the other plants on there could be uh, the same. Uh, I would have to go through the list and, and look at the botanical name to say for sure. Okay, and I think we will be providing the list so people can look at all the specific ones. And, um, and that, I would point out, that's just a, a, a difficulty with common names as opposed to botanical names. So there's, for example, when, when somebody says butterfly bush, it could be any one of a number of, of plants that they're talking about. Uh, so to, to be sure that the specific plant you're asking about is on there, you'd have to look at the botanical name. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, Karen asks, are there calorie pair in the boot heel? And I think she's referring to some of those maps you showed. Um, I have to assume that there is. Um, I don't spend much time down there to say just how abundant it, it is as an invasive species, but I, I, I will guarantee you it's down there as a landscape ornamental. Um, the, <clears throat> in the boot heel, it's, I, I consider it a, a whole different world from the rest of Missouri, at least from my work as a forester. Um, so it's, you get into to completely different species sets and it's so, so very much um, converted to, to row crop agriculture that it, it doesn't have the, the upland pastures in the type of idle ground where calorie pear tends to thrive in most of the rest of Missouri. Okay, and Nadia asks, how close um, are we to stopping nurseries and other businesses from selling calorie pair? Hopefully, very, I mean, hopefully close. Um, and there, <clears throat> most have already stopped voluntarily, um, especially the, the local growers, uh, the local nurseries, they by and large have stopped. Um, a lot of the, the landscape installers recognize that it's essentially a poor tree and and even not looking at the the invasive qualities just the structure as a an ornamental tree and i mean to me the smell is enough to to turn me off to it um but <clears throat> yeah it, it it's going to be as soon as we can get the, the cease to sale through to the finish line um that would be the the time span for us um i i would also take this chance to, to point out and i don't have it open in front of me but Brooke had shared an email from, uh, I believe, uh, uh, a, grow native, a grow native member or uh, just an individual that had shared some feedback um, through as a response to one of the announcements for this webinar um, that he had last year reached out to, got in touch with the, the CEO for Home Depot and through multiple communications back and forth conveyed the, um, the invasive qualities of calorie pair and 
the the CEO got the regional purchasing rep involved, and now Calorie Pair um, voluntarily is no longer sold in Missouri by Home, Home Depot. So kudos to um, the people that reached out on that, and kudos to Home Depot for for voluntarily um, agreeing to to stop selling Calorie Pair in Missouri. Um, we back in the very early days of the the work on cease to sale. Carol David, the, the chair of Moep, had reached out to, and I, I don't remember positively the store, but I believe it was one of the blue ones, um, and asked them the same question, talked to one of their regional reps, and essentially got a resounding no, we will not stop selling it as long as, um, as, long as it's not illegal, we'll continue to sell it if people are buying it. So again, kudos to Home Depot and, and for the efforts to, the, the efforts to, to make that happen. Yeah, that's some good news. Uh, we have a few questions that are kind of related. Um, do you have uh, from Do you have a pre preemptive plan for the future species? And um, how do you? And another person asks, how do you envision adding to the list in the future? So once we get to a final proposal, that will absolutely be a part of it is essentially how, what are the criteria for adding species to the list? And the, by the same, the, the other side of that, what are the criteria for removing a species from the list? Uh, we don't have that specifically finished as of this point, um, as I sit here right now, but that that will be included um, before we finish and are ready to, to pass this off to the, the legislative level. Um, is we, we will have a, a framework for exactly what at least we envision that looking like. Um, and would you tell me the other, the other half of that question I had forgot? Um, yeah, basically, do you have a preemptive plan and how do you envision adding to the list in the future? And so with that, the, the original assessment was all done by Excel spreadsheet and manual compilation. Um, I've, I've got a, a working demo of essentially an online version of the assessment, something that can be continually updated. And, and as new species come, you know, become uh, on our radar or, or start to show up in neighboring states, uh, we can start to include those. So I, I would very much like to see the assessment be more of a, a continually evolving uh, model as opposed to just a, a one-time snapshot. And with that, um, the ideal scenario would, would be that we include surrounding states in the same sort of framework so that um, essentially we can get advance notice as those species are coming across. Um, but with that, I, I would point out, and I, they didn't make it into my, into my slideshow here, but some of the individual comments that we got um, from, from various organizations uh, were referencing counterparts in other states are having major problems with this. Uh, it makes sense to, to address it here before it becomes a problem. And that's a, a big part of, of what we're hoping to do is to eliminate these problems before we start. If we could go back in time and, and eliminate calorie pair, eliminate bush honeysuckle, pick a species and name it, if we could manage to prevent that species from becoming prevalent on the landscape, that's a, a major difference in where would, we would be at today. So uh, that's a, a, a big thing we're trying to accomplish is to, to help to, to stop those potential future species from ever becoming problem species in Missouri. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a few questions related to highways. Um, Aina says the, cease, the sale is fantastic. Um, in respect to say calorie pair, the highways are inundated with them and the buyback program cannot address wild spread. Will there be any funding of MoDOT to address um, brush hogging these small trees down? That I can't say. Um, that's that's not, not something that I'll have any any direct say in. Um, I, I would say I, I would certainly hope so. Um, I agree that that it's necessary, and and Modot field staff would agree that it's necessary. But that all comes down to budget and manpower. Yes. Um, all right. Let's see. We had one from um, anonymous. Uh, are there any good models or examples of replacement programs for landowners to remove invasive ornamentals with non-invasive, especially the showy ones favored by homeowners? 
Um, I actually have a, a different set of slides. Um, if we get to the end here and uh, I can I can pull up a different presentation and go through a set of slides that, that give a dozen or so potential uh, native alternatives to, to landscape trees. Um, but I can I can do that here at the end. Okay. Okay, is MOIP uh, exploring any related movements to prevent state and local municipal buyers from ordering and installing invases on public land? So this, the cease sale initiative, at least the way we envision it, would, would not discriminate on private versus public buyers. It would be a blanket, um, the, the sale is ceased uh, regardless. So, so no, we're not working a, a separate initiative in parallel on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, maybe we can go ahead and um, share those other slides you were talking about. Yep, give me one second here. All right. Um, first species is downy serviceberry. Um, one of my favorites. It's it's one of the first uh, native woodland trees to flower in the spring. Um, loose clusters of white flowers. Good fall color. There are several um, cultivars available that, that emphasize spring flower, fall color both. Um, some extra benefit to those. The, the fruits can be used in jams, jellies, and pies. Next would be deciduous holly, um, also known as possum haw. These are e extremely vibrant berries um, that, as you can see in that middle picture right there, can can be um, a dramatic effect. And these are these are persistent through most of the winter. Um, the the one distinction is <clears throat> they're the berries only occur on female trees. So to to guarantee that you get a berry display. You need to make sure that there is a male tree available to pollinate it to create the fruit. Uh, so the, the ideal would be to plant multiple female trees if you wanted multiple plants um, with at least one male available for pollination. Next would be a nine bark. Uh, it's a, a smaller shrub, abundant white flowers in the spring. Uh, it's one of my favorite landscape shrubs. Um, the, it does have winter appeal also with the, the peeling bark. Uh, it's been described as appearing to, to peel and curl into the shape of a number nine, which is where it gets its, um, it gets its name from. There's several ornamental cultivars, purple leaf, yellow leaf varieties. Um, so there's, there's quite a few to choose from on the ornamental cultivar side on that one. Um, tulip tree is one of our uh, native magnolias. It, it just catches the boot heel as far as native to the state, but it grows well throughout the state. Uh, a lot more upright cylindrical, or not cylindrical, but an upright oval form, um, as opposed to a, an oak or a maple that may be wider than it is tall. This tree is, is always relatively upright, uh, large magnolia type, more, more yellow than you would typically think of, or at least that I typically think of for a mag magnolia flower, um, but, uh, but still that, that very thick, uh, large flower. Uh, and then the, the leaves turn yellow in the fall. Musselwood, also known as American hornbeam, has has really interesting bark. Um, the 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 shape of the wood under the bark it's it's really thin gray bark. Uh, it it's been described as a tensed muscle. It has long ridges um, that go up along the tree. Uh, this this one's going to do best in partial shade, um, morning sun, afternoon sh afternoon shade, same as a flowering dogwood. Um, Good fall color on this one also, yellow, red, purple into the fall. And black gum is, in my opinion, one of the, the more underused um, 
native alternatives. Uh, this this would rival any red maple for fall color. Um, it's it's just absolutely stunning fall color with the the bright scarlets and yellows and oranges um, all the way through. And it it uh, the flowers are not showy in the spring, but as it says here, they they are a, an excellent source of nectar for um, for bees. Then flowering dogwood, our state flower, um, it's I'm sure most, if not all of you know it, but the, the white petals are not actually the flowers. Those are, are bracts surrounding the flowers. Um, but these are, again, this is another species that, that does well or does best, not in full sun, um, but in, in partial shade. Morning sun, afternoon shade is the, the best for a flowering dogwood. Then black haw, you'll typically get um, abundant clusters of smaller flowers uh, through to some good good color in the fall. Um, purple berries, they won't stay on the on the plant nearly as long as the possum haw berries do, the red ones earlier. Um, but the, there will be purple berries through the fall. And then yellow wood, um, long um, hanging panicles of flowers. Um, the it's a very unique tree. It looks almost like a beech with the the really thin, smooth yellow bark. Or I'm sorry, the the th smooth gray bark um, turns yellow in the fall. Then smaller shrubs, silky dogwood is always a good one. Um, the 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 Twigs are twigs, and all the way down to the branches are a, a very striking red color um, that, that stays obviously through the winter on the twigs. Um, yellowish white flowers in the spring. Eastern Wahoo would be a, essentially the native version of winged burning bush, and the, the difference between Eastern Wahoo and wing burning bush, you can see up here at the top, um, wing burning bush has these corky ridges where Eastern Wahoo does not. Um, but the, other than that, it's, it's essentially the same plant. It's, it's not going to be as dense as a burning bush tends to get, um, but it, it will still have the, the brilliant red in the fall. And then I've got one vine included, uh, Dutchman's pipe vine. It's the, the host to the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. I've not actually seen this vine in person, but just looking at the, the fall photo there, I'm, it's one that as soon as I find it, I will likely buy it and plant it myself. And so any other additional questions? Yeah, that was a great list of plants. There's lots of alternatives. Um, Todd asks, are you working with the state nursery to grow these natives for sale? Or I'm assuming they already have a lot of them for sale. They, the, the state nursery um, just sells bare root saplings. And I have not confirmed that they have all of the ones that I just listed. I know that they have several of them. Um, it, they, they, well, I know that they don't have all of them. I've never seen yellow wood offered. I've never seen tulip tree offered. Um, through the state, state nursery, but those are all bare root saplings. So a, a typical landscape tree uh, would usually be would be planted as a, um, a larger container or a ball and burlap tree. Um, but there are multiple nurseries and, and native plant sellers around the state um, that, that do deal in native trees and shrubs. So I'd, I'd encourage you to go through the, the Grow Native Professional Member directory and, and reach out to your local nurseries and, and see what they have. Okay, we had lots of comments that thank you for what you're doing. Um, and then one person asks, do you have another presentation tomorrow that you'd like to give us the information for? Yeah, it will be um, tomorrow's presentation. I'm doing another webinar tomorrow evening. Uh, will be specific to calorie pair, and um, it'll be in conjunction with it. That's through Deep Roots KC. Uh, Ryan Amherst with Kansas Forest Service uh, will will also be speaking on background on calorie pair, um, the the status of calorie pair and and its invasiveness on the Kansas side um, and then I'll get into a little bit more depth on the, the calorie pair specific activities for MOIP um, with the, the buyback programs and and that sort of thing tomorrow. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Matt. That was a great um, introduction to the up, or update to ceasing the sale. Um, and as mentioned before, this webinar has been recorded and a link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with any resources mentioned during the presentation. Our next webinar is April 13th at 4 p.m. titled Intro to Beetles with Betsy Beatros. Please tune in for that one as well. 
thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you.